John Carmack is one of the most famous, renowned and respected video game programmers in the world, in the industry. But he's more than that, he's an engineer, he's an innovator. He didn't have um, a respect for what you can't do. You know, he, he made things go very quickly. He figures out how to solve these, you know, industry changing things, moves everything forward, stops a project and then kind of looks around for a bunch of new problems to solve. He makes stuff up and then tells everybody how he did it. With Doom and with Wolfenstein, he effectively created a genre, and not only a genre, but in the first person shooter the genre, the biggest, one of the, the biggest genres in the world. Games like Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, it, it, these massive games could not have existed in some ways without, without Carmack. No one really saw it coming, you know, we'd had Wolfenstein, but it hadn't become kind of a household name in the same way that Doom did. You know, Doom became a killer app. It was something that sold PCs, it was something that everybody knew about. I remember being surprised that Doom, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's great, because a lot of us had been playing around with 3D graphics, sort of maze search demos, if you like. It was just the way it took it to a different level. What John Carmack did was teach the video games industry how to create and structure 3D space. I think the main innovation was making the software rendered texture mapping go very fast, but that's probably because I'm from a techie background. <laughs> there were so many tropes that were first seen in Doom that sort of, you know, it invented the grammar of first-person shooters. You know, I don't think anybody can, you know, point back to earlier stuff and say, no, 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 it was, it was, it was Doom that, that gave us the first-person shooter, and it was Doom that told us how it all works, how it should work. And then, of course, there was multiplayer. Because Doom had a multiplayer feature, um, suddenly we're playing against each other. There were multiplayer games before, you know, you'd play RPGs that were kind of turn-based, but death matches were a whole new thing. It was a term that had been around before, but it was totally popularised by Doom. Doom worked really well on a LAN, and even a LAN was a huge innovation back then. Um, but it just showed that what, what, what John was thinking about was pretty ahead of its time. And this was something that was, was huge, you know, it wasn't something that was you know, happening in isolation. So another really important thing that Carmack did with Doom was to create this modding community. What that meant was that other people could get hold of the Doom engine and create their own games, but also um, lots of people created their own levels for Doom and distributed them online. So it was a really early understanding that the community was part of the development process. You know, that effectively got thousands of people who are in the game industry now into game development because they realised that they weren't just watching Aliens, they weren't watching Evil Dead, they were watching something that they could reach into and change for themselves, they could interact with and make a different game. More recently, um, one of the things that uh, has been really great that John was a very, very early advocate of was VR technology. And um, I think so many of us in the industry have found it so exciting, but he was there right at the start, um, you know, with his support for Oculus and then later becoming Oculus CTO. Carmack's approach to software development is always around solving problems. He has a passion for solving problems in inventive ways and he always comes up with the goods. You know, going from Doom to Quake to Rage and now his work at Oculus, he's looking at graphics in a way that says, what's wrong, what can I make better, and how can I make that accessible for everyone? He's kind of like the Shakespeare of, of 3D games graphics. When he speaks, what he has to say is valuable. He, you know, what, he, what he says is well chosen. There's always this sense of, um, you know, this is the, the essence, this is the nub of things. Ladies and gentlemen, the BAFTA Fellowship is awarded to John Carmack. Here you go. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm an engineer, and engineering usually involves a lot of fairly mundane things. You want your bridges that don't fall down, your apps that don't crash. 
And you don't really, you take pride in your craft, but you don't really expect a whole lot of recognition or even understanding from most people about what it is that you do. But sometimes you have an opportunity to build something that's from the future. And that's where things really do get exciting. I make it a point not to romanticize the good old days because as we've seen, things are amazing today and we're not in some fallen state from a better time. But there is something to be said for the early days when you're working on a frontier. Uh, when you're doing things that people haven't done before and you don't know what the right answers are before there's a top 100 list for a genre. I, the early days were of course very hard on the design side of things when I could say I can give you blocks and cardboard cutouts. Can we figure out something that's still really great to do with this? But with each hard fought technical advancement, more and more doors opened and the design space broadened until we get to today where a strong team can take any crazy vision and turn it into a reality. Now this is of course a wonderful thing for designers and for the people that play the games. But I do hear sometimes from programmers that are kind of sad that they don't have the opportunity to write game engines from scratch like I did and have it matter and have it make an impact. Uh, and here's where some perspective really helps. I can remember when I was a teenager, I thought I had missed the golden age of 8-bit Apple II gaming, that I was never gonna be Richard Garriott. And time went by and I got to make my own marks in things after that. And in that time, I also see so many other opportunities that have come by. I mean, the 90s PC wave was great. I was happy to be there and I'm glad I took a swing and knocked one out of the park with that. But since then, we've seen mobile games and web games and free to play games, the Steam revolution, and now virtual reality. So all of these are amazing. So yeah, the opportunities that I had aren't there for people today, but there are new and better ones. And personally, I'm more excited about these than anything that's come before. So thank you very much for this honor, but I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> John Carmack, you're taking home the BAFTA Fellowship tonight. Um, probably the only person in the room who could enjoy the ceremony because you knew you were going to get awarded that from the start. There was no nerves there at all. So, I mean, obviously, you, you have created so much in this industry and, and influenced so many people. Uh, as you walked into the room, people were sort of saying to you, I, I heard, oh, you're a legend. I, I, I love what you've done. I mean, does, does stuff like this ever become familiar? Do you ever get used to it? Well, to a degree, but I've always felt a little uncomfortable about these sort of lifetime achievement awards, the way they're put that way, because I've been doing this for maybe 25 years now, but I'm only 45 years old. <laughs> I've got a whole lot more programming left in me. It's worrying to think that you're getting a lifetime achievement award at 45. I mean, yeah. it's not a great prognosis for your lifetime. Is it? <laughs> There's plenty more to come, basically. Um, so obviously you started off in the 90s, the modding scene, everything like that. Um, do you think it's as easy for, for young developers to be given the same opportunities I guess now. So it's definitely different where there was an age where building Quake or Doom maps was the entry point for a ton of people right. into the industry and that was really great and I did go through a period where I was getting a little bit despondent about the modding because it required so much effort. Mm -hmm. It got harder each generation to the point where you basically had to be a professional developer to make a mod that would catch the kind of sight for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've sort of turned a corner now with things like Unity and Unreal, yeah. where you've got the, the asset stores and being able to go and work from that completely open body of work there. Yeah. So I think we're entering a new golden age of what people can do there. We've seen the amazing power that yeah. people have at their disposal. So you get these tiny teams yeah. that do things that could have looked absolutely state-of-the-art AAA not mm -hmm. that many years ago. Well, it's almost like modding has actually become part of development now. Like you think about things like XCOM 2, where you know the long more mod, the mm. long war mod guys were brought in to help out and stuff. It's it's obviously so important to development strategies and stuff. I mean, it's it's quite an exciting time. Yeah, and I don't think that's even been completely worked out how the whole value chain for that mm -hmm. goes. It feels like there's still something missing. You know, mm -hmm. Steam had made some steps with monetizing mm -hmm. mods, and there's we don't know how all that's going to sort out. But I have a feeling that we really aren't in the final form. 
year. Right. But there's something exciting yet to come for that. So John, over your 25 years, you've seen some exciting developments. Mm -hmm. uh, what's exciting you for the future? And is there anything that's cropped up mm -hmm. uh, sort of throughout that time or looking ahead that you were caught a bit by surprise with? Well, so right now, obviously, virtual reality is where I've placed my bet on yeah. where the excitement in the future is going. And uh, at this point, while I could say it's almost a lock, it's going to be magical. It is mm. magical, and great things are going to be coming from that. Um, you know, along the way, I like to point out about how I, I was focused on the first-person shooters, but I said, okay, we should go do something on mobile. We were doing mobile games before the iPhone. We were doing free-to-play with, uh, with Quake Live. I am... And we wanted to do sort of massively multiplayer stuff in the early days, but just didn't feel we had the resources to undertake it. So those all seemed like approachable um, opportunities. Like mm -hmm. Lots of people saw them. I saw them. Lots of other people did. Mm -hmm. But it took the people that saw them and then put their full weight of their commitment behind it mm -hmm. and hit all the right uh, buttons to make <laughs> it happen, to take off and have the huge successes there. Um, I mean, I think I probably was a little surprised at how successful the new generation of Steam games has been. Mm. That, yeah. uh, because I was coming out of you know, the, the huge pressure of AAA development and how resource intensive mm -hmm. it is. But then to see that we really did pass the knee of that curve about you can keep spending, but it's clear that you can deliver the magic of the gameplay mm -hmm. with much less effort than AAA is putting in. So mm -hmm. AAA is this bet about like on this diminishing return side right. that you knock everybody else out of it. But the magic of finding the right interaction method, that's still something that a few people can do now. Yeah. And it was... It was one of those I was just thrilled to see the successes that are coming up in each of those opportunities. So what do you think is the biggest hurdle that VR faces now going forward? Well, I focus on a lot of the, the technical issues where uh, I do like to say that traditional high-end gaming is fairly mature and it yeah. is, you can do anybody's vision right yeah. now. You've got enough power to do that. But you could say that VR is, even on the PC, is maybe six times as hard, where you've got to be, instead of 30 frames per second, you're at 90 and you're at stereo and you've got to have margin to not mm. drop and all of this. And then mobile makes it potentially 100 times harder than that. So there are technical challenges, like there really haven't been in the last five years on yeah. gaming. And you do see almost an education, a re-education that mm -hmm. has to happen, where there's a wonderful crowd of game developers that really haven't had to care about the technology. And that's a great thing. It was yeah. kind of like mission accomplished. You yeah. could go do your games without having to, to worry about the nuts and bolts so much. But now if they want to do VR, they kind of have to learn about some yeah. of the nuts and bolts there. It's but I think that you know the oh, the exciting part is going to be the things that are not what we expect, where we know what's good about all the existing mm -hmm. games. But just like it took a little while for mobile to find its legs, and uh -huh. you know until you get your Angry Birds or whatever that uses the touch screen in a way that's yeah. not like a D-pad uh, interface, it'll be a little while before VR hits on all of the things that turn out to be the real magic of the medium. Well, it's looking to shake things up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I mean, I think that's part of the reason why you were awarded a fellowship. Yeah, and you know? each of those opportunities, you notice it wasn't the established major players that that did that it mm -hmm. wasn't ea going and dominating on web games or mobile or something yeah. like that and it's probably it's not outsiders. going to be yeah this is the perfect opportunity to be you know be the next rovio mm -hmm. or something in vr so i uh, i mean i'm a huge optimist you can tell in the, the way i talk <laughs> about everything there are opportunities it's exciting mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful time and why not that's why you have a yeah. bafta yeah and you've been awarded a fellowship at age 45 john yeah. it, it's pretty good it's a good sign so <laughs> i can't wait to see what you're going to come up with next Thank you very Amazing. much. Amazing. Congratulations. Enjoy the party tonight. I have a lot of family back home in Belfast, and they don't really understand what doing video games for a living is like. They do understand BAFTA. It's really nice to be recognized by peers in the industry um, for the work that I've done. I've, I've been on all three games. I've done Geralt's Voice for Witcher 1, 2, and 3. Um, and it's been a, a really, really fun ride. And it's just nice for people.